Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and one of the things we enjoy doing most is introducing you to people who may not be household names, but who are making an invaluable contribution to Jewish life. And so on this edition of L'Chaim, I am so pleased to be joined by the chairman of the Board of Israel Bonds, Howard Goldstein. In addition to chairing Israel Bonds, Howard is senior partner at the accounting firm Apple Roth, Farah and Company in Miami, Florida. And Howard, thank you so much for joining us on JBS. A pleasure. Howard, before we talk about your work with Israel Bonds, I'd love you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your Jewish background. Where were you born and in what kind of Jewish family were you raised? Well, I was uh, born and raised in New Jersey. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, at the age of 10, uh, my father died. So it was my so mother sorry. and my brother. And we, thank you. And um, uh, yes, it's been uh, approximately 55 yurt sites, as I've counted these. And uh, I grew up uh, in an Orthodox shul. Uh, I had to uh, help raise my little baby brother, who was two, and my mom, you know, who was a widow at 36. And uh, unfortunately, we grew up on uh, food stamps and rent control. So I had a raison d'etre to really uh, bootstrap myself, uh, have a little Yiddish kite, which I do, and still by my mom, and some great memories of my father for 10 years. And what was what was your I father? To, uh, what was your father's name? Julius. What was Julius like? Julius. What was he like? Uh, personable. Everybody loves Julie. That's just what it was. Uh, he was a very affable person, as far as I could remember. Uh, we had a nice home life, uh, and we had uh, bagels and locks every Sunday morning. That's terrific. So and what's uh, your... it was. Uh, yeah. What's your mother's name? Uh, her name was Edda. Edda. T T A. And you and said she, she. Yeah, Edda, and she. She was an influence on you. Yes, she was my mother, the uh, the uh, the center for our Jewish life. I believe for any Jewish family, is the dining room table. Yeah. Then it's the synagogue. And then it's a, a federation or an Israel bond. So my mother was the chairman of the board at home. Do you, do you have warm memories of whatever Jewish life was in your home as you were growing up? Cooking. Food. Holidays. Yes. That was yes. Uh, the center fall, then she was exceptional. What is your brother's name? Uh, he passed away three years ago. I'm his name so was sorry. Jeffrey. What was his name? So, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Were the Wonderful two fellow. Were the two of you close? Oh, very. Very. When we weren't fighting, we were loving, <laughs> you know, and then we grew up, and then there was nothing we wouldn't do for each other. He was a marvelous fellow. Just marvelous. Where did you go to school? Uh, I graduated from Rutgers in New Jersey, and uh, I graduated in three years. I had to get to work to help support my mom, and I graduated with two majors. And uh, I just loved the construct of accounting. I loved uh, a lot of uh, <clears throat> you know, what I could do as a professional, meet a lot of people, engage in a lot of different platforms, industries, knowledge, you know, uh, that I could gather up myself. And I wanted to make something of myself. I think I was the first person in uh, my mother's family to go to college. Fascinating. So, um, and by the way, you have done well, yes? 
my wife tells me that I've done okay. Okay. My wife of 40 years, I've done okay. And, uh, you know, I, uh, my mother kind of instilled in me that whoever you are, whatever you do, uh, just try and make a difference. It has nothing to do with money, but just try to be a good influencer and a role model and basically just do the right thing. Just do the right thing because Hashem is always watching you. So that was a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, incentive yes. and a little bit of guilt. Yes. Which is a wonderful right. Jewish combination. It sounds like your mother was a very special person and your father too. And you were lucky to have them both. And I'm mm -hmm. really sorry you had your father for such a short period of time. Howard, I've read that your life changed completely on your first trip to Israel. First of all, is that true? And if it is, can you remember what prompted you to visit Israel for the first time? Um, well, I never had the ability to really almost go out of the country. Uh, I grew up in the Cheder and with all the stories and the history and then got very active in Israel Bond's new leadership. And I was not a sideline player or stayed in the bleachers, so to speak. So I uh, took on a uh, leadership role, a chairman role. And I was going to do the uh, trip from uh, South Florida for new leadership to Israel. And that was the first time uh, that I went there, inspired just to see with everything I've read. And I just wanted to make for the first time God a local call. I didn't want to talk to him long distance. I wanted to go right up to the hotel and talk to him. And that's what I did. Good for you. What year was that, Howard? I believe it's 85. 85. It was I also, 85. I also mm -hmm. read that you met your wife on your first trip to Israel. Is that true? No, I knew her before. Okay. I knew her before. And uh, we, we were just side by side for the last almost 40 years. What's her name? Marcy. Marcy. So you and Marcy have had a good time. Do you have children? Three. Beautiful. And two grandchildren, even more beautiful. Mazal tov. And she's Mimi, and I'm Zadie. Okay. Right. What do your children do? Uh, children. One's a teacher. One is in uh, management positions. And the other one is a, uh, as he called it, he's a geek with a personality. He's a very smart computer search engine person. Uh, and I'm very proud of them. Very proud of them. You have reason the best be part proud. of that is they, uh, yes, they have all educations with no loans. So that is what my wife and I promised each other, that our children would not, would go free and clear. And uh, it's a wonderful thing because I think that's what, uh, Jewish parent responsibility is, and uh, it kind of transcended into my importance of why I think new leadership, uh, of what I was near and dear to me, um, uh, has always been, and still as the worldwide chairman of Israel Bonds, still near and dear to me. I had two Zoom conferences on that this morning in between machinating a very large tax practice in South Florida. But you love what you do well, what you love what you do. Absolutely. So come back to the first trip you took to Israel. And again, when people go to Israel for the first time, there is something magical about it. Do you remember any of the things that struck you on your first trip to Israel? The same thing that struck me, you know, unfortunately, you only can go what I tell the many, 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 many trips I've been to Israel probably over 60 times. But the always thing I, I tell any kind of delegate that I that I take over is, unfortunately, you only can go to Israel for the first time once. Yes. And it does become very magical when you do that. And the same thing that struck me in awe the first time is for the first time in my life, because I grew up in a pretty poverty area with a, a bunch of uh, multiple cultures, 
the first time in my life, everybody in the street was Jewish. And it struck me uh, with just such a wonderful internal, external glow that I just thought, what a wonderful thing, uh, you know, to be Jewish. And, you know, and, I, and I've always said, uh, if I were to pass away and come back in my next life, there's three things I'd want to, uh, I'd want to have. Uh, the first, not necessarily in this order, but the first one, I need to be Jewish if I come back in my next life. It's just such a wonderful, uh, all-omnipotent feeling to have that. The second one, not that I'm trying to earn points, but I want to come back being married to my wife. She's just absolutely wonderful, okay, from start yeah. to finish. Yeah. And the third one I tell her is I'm still thinking about what the third one should be. So uh, along my journey, I'll let you know what I think the third thing I want to be when I come back is. Interesting. So I that's important. Were, that's the priority in my life. I thought you were going to say that the third thing is mm -hmm. you wish you had been born in Israel. No. no. I'm glad I was born in the United States. Good for you. No. I'm glad I was born in the United States. You know, because I am, uh, I'm not a, uh, uh, I'm an American Jew. I'm very proud of that. And I'm trying to do a lot of things as being a strong, try to be a strong leader in the diaspora. And as much as I'm growing up, I try to grow up, sometimes my wife says I've never grown up, is uh, along my journey, I'm trying to make a better connection. Uh, to use a play on words, a better bond between the diaspora in Israel, as well as when I talk to the ministers on a frequent basis in my position, uh, they also need to become more connected to the diaspora. So we both have to work on that, and I'm tirelessly working on that all the time, all the time, because there's uh, strength in connectivity. So I like to think that Israel Bonds gives me the medium and or the platform or the construct to uh, connect. We are a connector to, uh, from the diaspora to the state of Israel since Israel Bonds is worldwide. So I, I'm trying my best, and uh, I love a lot of the ministers that I have interfaced with all these years continually. That is so wonderfully said. Um... So let's talk about that for one moment. There's a sense, Howard, that many in the Jewish community have today here in America that there's a disconnect among a vast majority of younger Jewish adults, college age and older, when it comes to Israel. What's been your experience? Do you, do you sense that disconnect? Do you think it's overblown? What's your feeling? It's factual. I think, uh, Mark, it's factual. Uh, and that's part of my raison d'etre to uh, um, focus so much on new leadership. And new leadership, I always believe that the key to your success is how you groom your successors. I believe in Lador, Vador, Vador. Okay? The last Vador, which I say, is uh, this younger generation, the 20 and 30 year olds. And basically, even going past that, I think it starts in preschool uh, with learning about Israel and the Jewish culture. I don't think it has as much to do about religion as it's, I think it has to do with the substance of, uh, you know, being Jewish. Um, you know, sometimes they say uh, it's not uh, what you do. More importantly, it's who you are. And I think to have a solid identity as a Jewish person starting as early as you can. And so Israel Bonds does whatever it can in the colleges, going up young, giving them uh, points of uh, authority and responsibility, and uh, posting them up with, uh, you know, the creme de creme of Israel to try and get the diaspora younger Jew to connect with the state of Israel. Not everybody in Jewish life is an Alta Cocker. There are a lot of dynamic, great uh, potential synergies that you could make. One vision 
that I've always had, which we're going to, you know, try and pull off with this fabulous uh, Abraham Accord with the UAE. And I uh, uh, was in a small group conversation with the ambassador from um, uh, the UAE was he thought it was great and exciting for his young people to start to associate with, uh, you know, young Jewish people, young Israel people. So I have this vision and dream among many that I fulfilled or haven't fulfilled yet in my in my term is I want to bring new leadership from the uh, United States from the diaspora and meet those young people he's talking about from the UAE and get a, uh, a business to business synergy, cultural young people, no altar cockers, young people. And then hopefully, if I can pull this off, we're going to take that group, UAE and uh, the diaspora Jew and go to Israel and meet the Israeli younger people. So we have the quintessential uh, triad that connects all points of this wonderful, uh, in my lifetime, UAE, uh, UAE, you know, accord. And I think uh, it's up to the young people because without the succession there, I don't think we're going to be as forceful, as wonderful as we can be uh, down the road. What, what's down the road? I'm not sure, but I don't want to find out. I don't want to find out the end of the road. I want to continue this journey and this road. So that's what I've gotten everybody to buy in. Good for you. And uh, trying to make a difference. You're making a a wonderful difference. Uh, By the way, let's do this now. There are many people who know the phrase Israel bonds. But they don't know what Israel Bonds is or does. Explain to our audience, what is Israel Bonds? Uh, Israel Bonds is uh, a bond just like uh, a U.S. savings bond, just like any bonds that you can get from a corporation. They're issued by the state of Israel. Uh, It started in 1951 with the first prime minister, Ben-Gurion, uh, promoted by uh, Golda Meir in large rallies in Madison Square Garden many, many years ago. Fortunately, we are celebrating our 70th anniversary of Israel Bonds this year. Mazel. And I'm going to continue this celebration as long as I have uh, breath. Uh, and what it does, you can buy an Israel Bond in various terms and lengths, two years, five years, ten years, all kinds of denominations, and it pays an interest. That's very compatible to the U.S. Treasuries, and part of, and it's backed 100 percent by the State of Israel government. Never defaulted on principal, never defaulted on interest um, for 70 years. So part of it is an economic investment, wonderful, and the other part is the from the neshama. It's from your soul. It's from your heart. It's from your passion to invest in Israel. And I've always said that buying an Israel bond, if you, and you asked me a question before, you know, would you have wished that you were born in Israel? Well, I am part of Israel. I am Israel bonds. And what I say to myself and and many of the uh, uh, people who this year, we are approaching a billion five in sales at the request of the Israel government because they are uh, uh, hurting a little bit. And I said, if you can't live in Israel, okay, buying an Israel bond is a way to make economic aliyah to the state of Israel. So you're making an investment in your brethren, your brothers and sisters, and you're showing as a role model to every person you try and touch. Going back to your point of the new leadership, younger people, this is how you can connect with Israel. You can do trade with Israel. You can buy an Israel bond and, uh, and see where some of this money has gone and continues to go. Where's you have going? the ability to connect again. That's important also. How is the money that comes in from Israel bonds used in the state of Israel? Uh, great question. I'm going to give you a general answer because that's the only answer there is. We don't have any specific projects. It goes immediately within probably a day or two into the general fund of the state of Israel government. And what do they use it for? 
They use it for whatever the government uses it for. Exactly. They use it. Uh, back then, there was a strong draw for the Olim coming in. Uh, there was always, uh, you know, uh, desalinization uh, plants, power plants in Chedera, uh, housing that I walked the uh, housing projects. I was blessed with then uh, housing minister, uh, Eric Sharon, when he was building all that for the Olim coming in from Russia. Uh, fascinating projects, but they put it to use what governments do. And yes, of course they use it for defense because that's part of their budget, but not a big part of their budget. A lot of it is uh, school, um, uh, housing, uh, poverty, um, all kinds of other disciplines that any government, uh, you know, on the planet uses it for. So we are supporting Israel regardless of who's the prime minister. This is not a political affiliation. This is absolutely a partner to me, the best partner that Israel can have from the diaspora to Israel. So these are our partners, and this is our extended uh, mishpucha. And that's how we feel about it, Israel Bonds. I love the way you say it, Howard. And I've never heard it said, first of all, I've never heard it said that well, but I haven't heard it said that way. And this idea that you're making economic aliyah, that, that is fabulous. Um, it's interesting. It's almost like for one moment you had to apologize for the fact that some of the money being used from Israel bonds would go to military. And I'm wondering whether that's because you get pushback by some American Jews who say to you, well, wait a minute, if I buy an Israel bond, am I in some way supporting the IDF? And I don't want to support the IDF. And I'm wondering if, if that's something you've encountered. Um, very limited because uh, the, the real uh, narrative is you're supporting the entire state of Israel. You're supporting the only nation of Jewish people. And they have a sovereign right to protect their borders uh, as, as any country does. Of course. So instead of being political... Instead of being political about the process and where the money gets put, we want to make it the strongest country possible, the phenomenal intellectual property that is grown and matured on a continual basis with probably, by far, the most uh, prize-winning Nobel Prize uh, economic technology uh, per capita, inconceivable of any other part of the world. I'm proud of that, and that's where my – it's all part of one basket that stimulates the entire outcome of what Israel uh, becomes. And, and like I said before in, in one context, it's not what you do. It's who you are. And we're trying to create a much stronger image, identity, uh, through truth, through fact of what Israel – really is who she is and i'm proud to be associated with who she is she is uh you know she's my homeland and i want to always have that homeland otherwise what would i ever tell my successor or my lador vador vador people why are we doing this it's not just a religion it is a culture and i love my culture you know, and I also miss my mother's cooking, which my wife has taken a lot of my mother's recipes, and she's exceptional at doing that during Yontif. Well, good for your wife. And again, I love the way you say it. I, I must ask, when you say that the yield on Israel bonds today, by the way, you know, when I became Bar Mitzvah, everybody gave me an Israel bond. That was what everybody did in that generation. It's not done as much now. And I'd love to see it become something that Jews... They're coming back. Yes, yeah. They're coming back. But you, know, coming. you said that basically the yield is similar to U.S. Treasuries. So the reality is, mm -hmm. Howard, that at the moment, Israel bonds... The, it's, you don't buy an Israel bond necessarily because you're going to get a high interest, correct? Mm -hmm. It's always been that way, by the way, Mark. 
we've always been a little uh, above the, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. Treasury. Um, the professionals in the organization who are licensed to sell bonds do that, and they go through that diatribe. It's my, uh, it's my um, uh, duty and responsibility to understand the differential. But the differential really is that you're supporting bonds. And let me give you an example. Uh, 35% or so of people who are, or, or places that own Israel bonds are not Jewish. Surprised? Yes. They are not Jewish. It's institutions. It's the state governments. It is uh, people who are not Jewish. Uh, we are having uh, a lot of uh, uh, fortunate results with combining things in um, uh, the non-Jewish world also. Uh, I think we have uh, a lot of governments, state governments, which were allowed. Uh, keep in mind, state governments for the longest time were not allowed to buy a foreign instrument. And we in Florida, I was part of the contingency that went up and convinced them to change their charter that you cannot buy foreign instruments except for the state of Israel bonds. So uh, we now have, I believe, I don't know the exact figure, but we probably have an excess of 30 states that now uh, allow you to buy Israel bonds in their state treasury and their state pensions. We have marvelous, marvelous results from that. We have marvelous results from individuals Jewish, you know, and non, you know, and non-Jewish. Uh, and we also have um, uh, wonderful different programs where you can finance bonds. We have wonderful programs where, uh, like you said, I'll go back to the bar mitzvah because. I believe that some of the immaterial become material. I think the more people, grassroots, we get involved in just owning that little, it's not a piece of paper anymore like it was when you got bar misfit, but just owning that little piece. Uh, and what we have a lot of, uh, and I push it on my board, and they react very well, a lot of people will go to the synagogue and say, I'm going to give, I'm going to donate money and to the synagogue and they're going to buy every person who's born bat mitzvah this year an Israel bond, period. We right. started a campaign with, um, uh, with uh, you know, Hanukkah uh, to give an Israel bond on one of the nights of the eight nights. How and the one thing that I had an epiphany on, what's that? It's no, a, and one thing it, I had an epiphany on. That's a brilliant on idea. Is, is and everybody should give. It's but a did, lovely did, gift to give on, on Hanukkah or any other Jewish holiday. Two more things uh, that I thought of in Epiphany uh, during Passover that uh, a year ago, and we had the first campaign this year, that uh, we invented uh, the Afikomen bond. So when you uh, look for the Afikomen for Passover, you put a little note that a bond has been purchased for you, wrapped up in the afikomen from the middle matzah, and now you have achieved an afikomen. Every seder can have some kind of linkage, bondage, connectivity to the state of Israel bonds. Great, Howard, great. What's the other one? Uh, I'm just trying to think what the other one uh, that we're having is. Um, I told you about the uh, bar and bat mitzvah bond, the twinning, etc. Uh, and by the way, if we had another hour, the list goes on and on. We have some of the most incredibly creative professionals in our organization. I love. And, and, and I'd be remiss, my friend, who is also my partner and the paid professional in this, is Israel Maimon, who is the CEO of the State of Israel Bonds. And he Just was, marvelous and you should know, action. he was on Lachayim and he was fabulous. I know. He is fabulous. He is fabulous. And, uh, you know, so we have a great partnership. We have a love for each other because we have the same passion. And, uh, listen, I can say anything to him that I want because I'm not paid. So I have very good job security in what I do, and we, uh, we really compliment it. We really enjoy each other's company and creativity. And that kind of all trickles down to my board of fabulous 18 people from around the country and his incredible staff, okay, that's around the country. That is so, wonderful. Uh, we're privileged. By the way, Howard, how long have you been chairman? 
Uh, I've been chairman about two and a half years, and I think my term, if they keep on liking what I'm doing, uh, I don't think it should go on below, uh, you know, past five years, maybe six years, nothing more. Okay. Because, again, the key to your success is how you groom your successors, and I need successors to take over my position. And, and they don't many, want an Alta Cocker eventually that'll be on the board. How many people are on the board altogether? Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay. Eighteen. I it thought five was, was a pretty good number. And I know this is a mundane question, but in case anybody watching right now says, Oh gee, I, I'd love to, you know, have an Israel bond. How do how does one literally obtain an Israel bond? Go to the website. Uh, the website has a newsletter. I publish a newsletter about our organization every two months. You can get on the email, israelbonds.org, and it gives you rates. It gives you everything you didn't want to know and everything you do want to know. You can get on the free email uh, list. We have many, 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 especially the, the, the uh, creativity of navigating through this pandemic. So you can get on the website, you can buy a bond. We also, the, oh, the other thing I just remember that I thought was fabulous, which I pushed from the old chairman to, to you know, my platform, is we have an app that you can have on your phone that if you're registered to buy a bond, which many, many people are, and you're on the way to a, um, a wedding and you didn't get the bride or the groom a gift, you can go on this app in your car, buy a bond, get charged your credit card. It will send the congratulation of an Israel bond to there. And this is what I wanted to gear for the new leadership. And why, why wouldn't we do that? Because Israel, the state of Israel, is the most technological, uh, intensified country that I know. So we represent Israel. That's what some of the money end, ends up circuitously coming back to even enhance the uh, the rest of the diaspora. So now, way, I always thought that was a great idea. It is a great idea. You have not yet implemented that, though. Yes, sir. We sure have. You have. You can so, go if you're registered to buy a bond. You can you can you can buy uh, a bond and donate it and donate it to uh, a college. You can donate it to Federation. You can donate it to many, many, many other charities. Or you can give a real good Mazal Tov to the bride and groom, which you forgot to buy the gift, but you're on the way to the wedding. I love it. By the way, in general, how do you feel Israel Bonds is doing compared to prior years? Yes, but even more, I, again, I'm wondering whether Israel Bonds today has the same power and the same name recognition that it had in my parents' generation as I was growing up. To what extent are you finding there's a, you know, a branding issue that is making this difficult for you? Um, great question. I address it every day. I think that uh, Israel Bonds over the last several decades has lost its identity, you know, to some degree, has lost some of its branding. It used to be a knee-jerk uh, purchase to get an Israel Bond for your bar mitzvah. It was just a knee-jerk. There wasn't a question. It was just a quid pro quo. That's just what was done. So as a result, when I started uh, 35 years ago, but when I started with new leadership, I wanted to rebrand, continue to um, make this a cultural part of your Jewish DNA. And I think if you have Jewish DNA and the Jewish DNA had a portfolio, it should have an Israel bond in it. Absolutely. Every part of Jewish life, traditional passage, all those wonderful things should have an Israel bond. So that's what we try and strengthen. Um, why? My question is, why not? You know, they're affordable. We have uh, inexpensive bonds, and we can have uh, we have million dollar buyers. It's all it's same, uh, and the government loves the passion of increasing the grassroots and the amount of units to people that we sell, and never ever ever forget. And I learned this in my 
you know, my federation and, and, and APAC involvements and all kinds of things along my journey that don't think that the government takes a look. I know it for a fact they take a look, uh, individuals, amount of bonds that are bought in Jewish institutions to see the passion and commitment of the Jewish culture investing in what they do. So I th I've always thought, I don't know, uh, you know, factually, it's an influencer when there are things that uh, Israel needs from the United States government, from other governments, that they see the passion of the bond dollars that come in. We always have, uh, you asked one question, the last several years, marv marv marvelously, okay, marvelously, that um, we have sold around a billion, billion one a year for the last several years, probably Roger. six or seven. And the Israel government came to uh, Israel Maimon and myself and said, we need uh, more. We have a pandemic. We're not doing well. You have a pandemic. You're not doing well. But you think you can muster up a, st a strategy to generate another approximately $400 million. So I, I usually don't hyperventilate much, but I started to strategize what we can do. The phenomenal professionals at our organization started to do the same. And I uh, will tell you right now, we're right there. We're within several million dollars. We're having a huge real estate event, by the way, with uh, Larry Silverstein and David Rubenstein in a real estate chat for our real estate division. And we're going to raise a lot more money, and a billion five is uh, huh, not going to be a problem. But I'm I couldn't say you. that six months ago when they asked us. That is fabulous, and it's a tribute to you. It's a tribute to your entire board, and it says something wonderful about the American Jewish community. Um, out of curiosity, the Jewish community is fractured right now over politics as America as a whole is fractured. Do you have any insight on what you hope ways in which Jews who don't talk to each other, they hate each other, all over politics, do you have any insight as to what you'd like to see American Jewry do as we move forward? I think we have to find a common thread. And I've always told my board that, that whatever we discuss at the board meetings, non-political, we have to be one voice. One voice. And the, the Jewish population is not one voice. It's many voices. You know, and we've known that for a long time. We have to tag on to something that would be a glue factor for the Jewish culture, speak in one voice. What do you want? Not what you don't want, what you want. You know, what kind of Jewish culture do you want to be left to your children and your grandchildren? What are you going to tell them that you did to make one voice so this can come true? And it's not just about money. It's about intellect, and it's about passion, and it's about what will bond you to make sure the state of Israel survives. Um, state of Israel is, is a big common bonding factor for the most part. Uh, everybody wants. I have not met a Jew who said they didn't want the state of Israel to exist. I don't know everybody. I'm sure some say that, but I can't believe that anybody would say. So start there, work from there, okay? Make that your uh, journey, make that your roadway, make that your passage, and make that your narrative that you want Israel to survive for millenniums, okay? I think that's very, very important. And start from there. You can do different things from Israel. You can do trade with Israel. You can invest in Israel. You can buy their sovereign debt in Israel. Uh, and you don't have to do anything political, because I'm not a very political person. But I think if you hook on to that, I think, you're, I think it's a good start. And it's hard to sway away from saying, I love Israel. I want this to survive. I challenge anybody to say they don't want Israel to survive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want you to speak to another 
sensitive issue in the Jewish world. There are those American Jews who are upset with the state of Jewish pluralism or the lack thereof in Israel as often depicted as one of the major reasons for non-Orthodox American Jews to feel somehow negatively toward Israel. The Orthodox rabbinate is in total control of the laws of family law, marriage, divorce, burial. Government funds Orthodox institutions, but barely does so for reform or Masorti institutions. The Western Wall controversy over an egalitarian section where men and women can stand together, where women can read the Torah, is symbolic of this larger issue. Howard, what would you say to American Jews, especially non-Orthodox American Jews, about this issue of Jewish pluralism in Israel? And should it make them feel as if Israel is less theirs? A great question. No great answer. Uh, I think uh, for the uh, one voice of loving Israel, that it's there for you in whatever form, whatever religious base, whatever uh, tradition, non-tradition, uh, there is a part of Israel that's for you. Governments come, governments go. I've learned that a long time ago with a lot of naivety. But as long as the government still stands as a country, not as a political party, I think you'll always have a state of Israel to wonder about, to love, to study about, to see the heritage in your, in your younger people in Hebrew school as it goes through their life, right through their end of their life. So I think uh, that, that's, what I, that's what I do tell other Jews who don't believe a lot of things that uh, uh, rather different factions in Israel, rather the government's position in that. I think you have to look more macro than micro. I think you have to look at this Israel, this is our homeland, and you can make of it whatever you want, but don't tell me you don't want a state of Israel. And that's what I go back to the original alpha of what I said. Don't tell me you don't like that. Don't tell me you don't love that. Don't tell me you don't embrace that. And don't tell me you're going to tell your children, don't worry if you have a state of Israel or not. I can't conceive of a Jewish person saying that. So focus on the macro, not on the micro. The micro comes and goes. We see that in this country. We see that in this country for centuries, for the two-something centuries we've been in existence. And Israel, fortunately, since, you know, 48, uh, we've experienced change too. Great paradigm shifts. Uh, some are good. Some are not as good as others. But I'm a, gla I'm a person glass half full. And I think uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. And I also tell the people who like to fetch a lot, okay? I'm not a fetcher. So I would say, that to me, there are three types of people in this world. There are people who make things happen. There are people who watch things happen. And there are people who wonder what happened, okay? Don't be the last two. Be the person who makes something happen. And I think that is leadership that people can opine, uh, connect with, uh, and embrace with. And then think of the macro and do something about it. If you don't like something, do something to change it. The same theme of uh, you, you don't like what's going on in uh, any country, vote. If you're God willing in a democracy, vote. Do something about it. If you want to make some changes uh, that you think you can make it better, be involved in Israel bonds, be involved in APEC, be involved in federation, be involved in anything that could righteously uh, make a difference to people around you. People thirst for people to lead them in the right direction because they're not sure what direction to go in. So do that, which I think is perfect. By the way, did you ever think of becoming a rabbi? Uh, no, but I thought of becoming a psychologist. <laughs> no, I, lo I love, um, it, you know what's interesting? Uh, it's funny that you ask that. I, I love people. I love to uh, 
uh, be with people. And I think one of the greatest things I have been as managing partner of firms, as uh, chairman of boards, et cetera, et cetera, I think in order to be a great leader, you have to be a world-class listener. And if you miss the uh, 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 possibility of being a world-class listener, I learned so much things by not waiting for my chance to talk, but listening to people who are smarter than me, and they really um, uh, make me much better to be around somebody. Uh, my wife also is a great, you know, influence on me because she is uh, the yin and my yang. She's the balancer. Um, and I think the best part of uh, leading is just to make sure people uh, get a chance to express themselves and they're part of the whole. So I run my organization as Rabans that they're part of the whole. There's nobody left out. Everybody's part of the thing. And I don't work, uh, people don't work for me. Board members don't do things for me. Uh, everybody uh, does things with me. And I do that with them. It is a hand-holding uh, thing because that's part of being uh, a group. Uh, that's part of being a culture. And I then again get back to the one voice, think the same, act the same. You have diverse opinions, which is wonderful. But uh, be one voice, direct it to there, and don't let ever go the state of Israel from your mind. By the way, I am sure you're a fabulous accountant. And it sounds to me like you're doing a magnificent job as chairman of Israel Bonds, but you also would have been a wonderful rabbi if that had motivated you. You would have been a rabbi with real passion and, and, and courage. And I'm glad you are what you are, but mm -hmm. listening to you is just very, very inspiring. Uh, you said a moment ago, you're not really a Thank political you. person, but I do want to ask you this as yeah. you look at the American scene. Are you worried for the future of American Jewry in the United States? No. No, because I think more leaders are going to step up and keep this uh, direction going. That's the righteous direction. I think it's important. Uh, am I worried? I worry every day about so many things. That's part of my mother in me. So I, uh, I'm concerned. I try and think of better ways to do things, to uh, talk to people, and to make sure, at least if you have a great understanding, information, knowledge, and intellect, you're going to make the right decision. But you've got to have all the components in, in your mixing bowl to come out with the right recipe that makes that wonderful dish for you. And you, you can't, uh, you know, and I've always said in you know, some speeches, uh, et cetera, I am so much luckier than when I talk to a congregation. And there's lots of elderly people there. Uh, it, they don't have to be that elderly because I'm a lucky generation. Many people that I talk to uh, never knew what it was like not to have a state of Israel, you know, to the point I never knew what it was like not to have a state of Israel. I'm very blessed. I'm very fortunate. And there are tons of people that are approximately <clears throat> in their 70s that absolutely didn't know what it was uh, like to have a state of Israel. So we're the lucky ones, and we should make sure that our generation is the last generation that has that thought and has that ability to make sure that never happens. It's a, it's a never happen again thing. Good for and you. I think it's important that everybody realizes that. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. We're lucky. You have had the opportunity to know prime ministers of Israel over your career with Israel Bonds. Which of the prime ministers that you know, and I'm sure all of them were wonderful and impressed you, but of the prime ministers you know, 
uh, you have met new. Is there any who stand out in your mind as having had also an impact on you? You know, I, I, I've been blessed being, uh, you know, coming from where I came as a, as a young person, as a, you know, as a child. I have met so many, and I will tell you, every time I sat in a room with any of them, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, uh, my, my arm was red from me pinching myself that I could not believe I'm sitting next to, you know, the Eric Sharon's, uh, the Rabin's, all of them, all of them. I, I go back probably uh, 10 prime ministers that I've been privileged. I've announced them. I have uh, sat in a room in the King David and uh, introduced them. Uh, I am one of the most blessed people that, that I know, and I still pinch myself. Uh, anyone in particular? No one in particular. They all had such a fabulous uh, story and narrative to their history. I don't care if they were a general, if they were, you know, uh, other things in their profession, but they all were uh, uh, totally passionate with the state of Israel. That's what I respected, and all of them had a different spin to the current one, and I just had a uh, uh, the honor of uh, making a, a talk with Benny Gantz, who is going to be the next one. So I know a lot of the prior ones. I've gotten to know, you know, and started to get to know all of them. I think it's just a blessing. They're all marvelous, and to me, the prime ministers have been fairly superhuman because I don't know how one person could take on the entire Eretz Yisroel. So I just always feel from the bottom of my heart, I'm Israel Chai. It just has to be, I'm Israel Chai. And if you don't think that, I'm going to try and convince you to think that. I have one more question for you, and it brings us back to something you said at the very beginning of our conversation. I want you to take one minute or so to just riff on this. You said that of all the things in the world, what you, what is, if you came back again, what you wanted more than anything else would be to be a Jew because you feel that being a Jew is so wonderful. Take one minute, Howard, and this is how we're gonna end. What is it for you personally that is so wonderful about this Jewish thing which you are? Um, easy for me to answer. It's a feeling. It's not uh, something tangible. It is the intangible of the camaraderie, the unbelievable tradition and history of being a Jewish per uh, person. By the way, many other religions have this, okay? But I think the strong history, stories, um, uh, the cultural, the, uh, the uh, dining room table at your home being the central Jewish address for your life, uh, having parents, uh, the, um, the idea of uh, your parents continuing after they pass away through your side, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my mother still yells at me, and she passed away 20 years ago. So I have all these wonderful feelings, intangible feelings of how complete being Jewish makes me. Uh, and I never want to let that go. Uh, I will not let it go. And my children so far have listened to me. We're working on the grandchildren. So uh, all, all is good. And, uh, you know, like in that famous movie, you know, You Complete Me, being Jewish completes me. It really does. That is a wonderful answer. You are doing fabulous work on behalf, not simply the state of Israel, but for the Jewish people as a whole. It's been an honor and a joy to meet you on L'Chaim. I hope when this COVID is over, I'll have a chance to meet you in person. I'm happy to you know, meet you whether it's in Miami or New York or Jerusalem. But I wish you kol tu only good things and success as you move forward in your position of leadership as one who is helping to build Jewish life. And it's been an honor to have you on L'Chaim. Thank you, Howard, very, very much.
Thank you. It's uh, Listen, it's been my Aaliyah to sit here with you this afternoon and just chat with uh, a new friend. And I will tell you that um, uh, at the end of the day, I love what I do. It's, uh, it's an honor to do what I do. And um, if you want to ask me back sometime in the future, I might think of that third thing I want to come back as in my next life. That's fine. My best wishes to you, and you also send my good wishes to your wife. She's done a marvelous job at your side, and thank you for everything you do. We will meet one day. You be well. You be too. Stay safe, please. Thank you. Howard Goldstein, Chairman of the Board of Israel Bonds. I hope you've enjoyed meeting him and learning from him. And again, I hope many of you will take up his suggestion. There's a gift you want to give someone for a Jewish event, especially a bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, baby naming, wedding, anniversary. Consider Israel Bonds. And we've put their website up on the screen. Feel free to visit the website and actually purchase and Israel Bonds. As always, I invite you to share any thoughts you may have on any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me at rabbigolub at jbstv.org or you can write me at Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. And remember, you can now listen to L'Chaim as a podcast. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.